Hello YouTube, let's talk about prime numbers. Well, prime numbers. Allow me to introduce a game called Div. It's a browser game built by Alex Fink based on 2048 and other threes likes. If you're subscribed to this channel, you probably know my personal connections to 2048. Well, Div is my favorite game in that genre. I'll put the link to it on your screen. Div is a lot mathier than 2048. In Div, you move numbered tiles on a 4x4 grid, trying to combine them into higher numbered tiles to get a higher score. That's mechanically the same as 2048. But in Div, whenever one number divides another evenly, those two tiles can combine by adding. So this allows you to depart from the familiar powers of two and more fully explore additive and multiplicative number theory. Now, what are these prime numbers about? Div keeps a list of numbers above the board and puts a random one in a random space after every move. These are your seeds, and they are often prime numbers, but not always. The list of seeds changes as the game goes on in response to the tiles you have on the board. Seeds are unlocked when you make a tile that has a new factor, and seeds are eliminated if nothing on the board is divisible by them. Beneath the game, the author wrote how the unlock process actually works. After making a new value, the game divides it into as small of a result as possible using the existing seeds. If division is able to reach one, nothing happens. If you're left with some other number, the game will add that number to the list of seeds. The text at the top calls these primes in heavy quotation marks. You may ask, why would we expect this process to give primes in the first place? Let's try to understand this via an example. Say you had the seeds 2, 3, and 5, and you combined a 75 tile with a 3 tile. The result is 78. Say that we didn't know the factorization of 78 over all primes, and we were only trying to find the factorization over the primes 2, 3, and 5. We would fail. You can divide by 2 to get 39, and 3 to get 13, but then you're stuck. In this case, what's left over is a prime number, 13. Say you didn't have 2 as a seed, though. You can still add 75 and 3, those numbers can exist on the board with only 3 and 5 as seeds. But now you're going to try to factor 78 over just 3 and 5. You divide by 3 to get 26, and now this is where you get stuck. In this situation, we unlock the composite number 26 as a prime. When you start having composite numbers as seeds, the game can get a little crazy. Factoring new tiles over the set of primes, when some of these primes are actually composite, can be mind-bending. Could you predict what happens when I move to the left here? It gives us 5. What about here? It gives us 63. But if we also have 15 in the previous example, it would instead unlock 7. There's definitely logic to it, it's a computer program, but I've always found it fascinating how allowing composite numbers to act as primes adds new depth to this game. So, a few months ago, I started a quest. When the game is over, which happens when you have no more legal moves, it shows you all of the seeds you unlocked during that game. It also gives you a score, but for the moment, I don't actually care about the score. All I care about is this final list of seeds on the Game Over screen. I want to assemble a collection of end screens from Div Games, unlocking as many distinct seeds as possible, prime or composite. I claim that every number 2 or greater can be a seed. Given this is a math video, let's actually prove this. Consider this version of the game. After every move, there's only one space for the new tile to spawn, and it will always be a divisor of the other tile, so it will literally be impossible to lose this game. For this, I also modified the random seed selection, so it will always place the largest seed. It's no longer a game, it's always forced moves, but it unlocks every number 2 and greater as a seed. Notice that every second turn we have a single seed and that tiles are that seed and it's square. Let's do some induction. Any of these can act as base cases. We have a tile and it's square. We want to prove that we will always have n and n squared on the board after every second move. So first add n to n squared and you get n times n plus 1 n plus 1 is never going to be divisible by n for n greater than 1, so we have to unlock a new seed, which will always be n plus 1. It spawns because it is the largest seed, and then n plus 1 adds to n times n plus 1, giving us n plus 1 squared. 
as before, since n plus 1 will never be divisible by n, and we have only one tile, n plus 1 squared, n is now eliminated. n plus 1 is now our only seed. That's the inductive step, so we literally just did a proof by induction while watching pretty colored tiles dancing around. Good job! What about in the real game? So I made this as a toy example, but nothing actually prevents this from happening in a full-size board. Every new tile placed has a 40% chance to be lined up with one tile on the board if it's otherwise empty, and when you have two seeds, there's also a 50% chance of spawning the larger one. This comes out to an 8% chance to get from the n and n squared to n plus 1 and n plus 1 squared, exactly like the proof on a full board. If it doesn't pan out, we could just reset. It's a really bad strategy to unlocking seeds, but it gives us a lower bound on the probability of unlocking a given seed n of 0.08 to the n minus 2. Certainly we can find a better strategy. Well, what does it take to unlock, say, 101? We might have some multiple of 100 and then add something to it. 200 plus 2 would do it, as would 300 plus 3. It's not the only way, though. We might have 1,005 and add 5 to it. The most common way to get a new seed is to have a multiple of 1 less than that seed on the board and add. But it also works to have 1 less than the product of that seed and some other seed. In this case, 1,005 is a multiple of 201, which is 1 less than 202. By the way, in addition to being visually satisfying, the tiles in div are an encoding of the real prime factors of the number, which is absolutely brilliant design by Alex Fink. This makes it easy to factor numbers just by seeing them as tiles. Anyway, back to 101. The smallest tile that can possibly be used to unlock a given seed is the product of two numbers. One is the seed itself, and the other is the smallest number, which is co-prime with the seed. Primes are co-prime to everything, so the smallest would be 2, so you get 2p as the smallest tile. For even seeds, like 26 from before, you need the multiplier to be 3, because 2 is unavailable. So 3 times 26 is 78, that is the smallest tile that ever could unlock 26. If we want to unlock a seed, we would need to build, at minimum, a specific tile. So let's talk about building tiles. For every tile on any board of div, that tile has a history, a tree of the tiles that merged to make it, and the tiles that merged to make them, and so on. Primes have a trivial history, nothing could ever combine to make them, so they have to be spawned exactly as they are. Composite numbers are more interesting, because they may be the result of merges. I'm going to make some simplifying assumptions. First, I'll assume that every merge was actually with a seed that just spawned, so the tree is kind of a fuzzy stick. Nothing to the right has any history. Second, I'll assume that the seeds that spawned are always prime numbers. This is a little ironic in context. I'll consider it a first-order approximation. Primes are the expected type of seeds, and by using a backdrop where they are the only seeds, we can tease out a nugget of what is needed for composite seeds. And finally, I'll assume that the tile at the top is old. It began its life as a humble two. So I want to go all the way back down on the bottom of this tree, or stick, to 2 plus 2 equals 4, my favorite mathematical fact. I'm interested in, put simply, the length of the stick. Given some composite tile on the board, I want to know the shortest stick of prime merges that could have formed that tile starting from 2 plus 2. This is a somewhat interesting question. Every time you move up the stick, you're only able to choose prime factors of the number you're on, so to make the stick as short as possible, you want to climb via numbers that have large prime factors. I used inductive reasoning to get a solution, but I would love to hear anyone's more efficient solution. Let me know below, I'm all ears. I'll explain the one that I came up with. The shortest valid stick for 4 is just 2 plus 2. Valid, it starts out with 2 plus 2 equals 4. Every step adds some prime divisor. Cool. Now consider some composite number that is greater than 4. Assume we know the shortest valid stick that reaches every composite number less than n, which is known as strong induction. We are relying not just on the number 1 less, but every lesser number. To find the shortest stick for n, we take all of the prime factors of n and subtract them off. All of these are less than n, so the strong inductive hypothesis seems within reach, but remember, the number needs to be composite, and this is why it's important that n be greater than 4. 
If we subtract off the smallest prime factor of some number, the result will factor as p times n over p minus 1. The second number is an integer, as n over p is an integer. The second number won't ever be 0 because n is composite, but we need it to be greater than 1. If n over p minus 1 is 1, then n equals 2p. We assumed p is the smallest prime factor, n is greater than 4, so p would be greater than 2, 2 is a smaller prime factor than p, so that's a contradiction. This proves that at least one result will always be composite if you subtract off every prime from some value composite n. It's sound then to look at all composite values n minus p, we know there's at least one. Now we can use our strong inductive hypothesis. For each n minus p, we know the length of its minimal stick, pick the shortest, and extend it by p. This is now the shortest possible stick for n, and it does start with 2 plus 2 equals 4 as required. So from this, we can actually build out an algorithm. I coded up that algorithm in Python, and I want to show you what some of these minimal sticks look like. The output of the code is on the left, and I'll show it as a mock game of TinyDiv on the right. For a good portion of this journey, we climb up what is known as a Cunningham chain. Cunningham chain refers to a set of primes where you get each next prime by going 2p plus 1 on the previous. 179, then 359, 719, 1439, 2879. From a strategy standpoint, Cunningham chains are a really powerful tool in div. In a certain sense, if you want to have the tile 12,345 on your board in a game of div, this gives a reasonably likely way you might get there. The stick being short means that this route is less susceptible to bad RNG than other longer routes. If you combine this information with the previous section, we can now find the smallest tile that would unlock a seed, describe a way to get to that tile. So if we want to unlock a seed, we just find the tile, find the easiest way to build it. There's one other step though. We need to eliminate any factors of the seed we're trying to unlock. Because a seed can only be unlocked if none of the existing seeds are divisors of it. If you wanted to unlock, say, 840, every seed from 2 through 8 has to be eliminated first. The smallest seed you could have is 9, and the smallest prime seed you could have is 11. So this is difficult and rare, and I don't have a first principles mathematical way to describe how hard and rare, but I do have data. Over the course of three months, between April and July, I estimate I played around 2,000 games of Div. I didn't keep track of the exact number of games, but I did keep track of all of the different seeds I unlocked. In total, I unlocked 1,470 distinct seeds. 592 of them were prime, the other 878 were composite. Sometimes I threw for content, picking to unlock a new seed instead of playing in a strategically optimal way. Here are actual screenshots from when I unlocked 264, or 1008. It might seem a surprise that so many of the unlocked seeds are composite, but I also got 592 primes, and the 592nd prime is 4337. While I didn't get only the smallest 592 primes, the point is that it starts to require some pretty big numbers. At that point, it's easier to unlock a smaller composite number even when there's a requirement to eliminate other factors first. How much easier is what I've been interested in trying to quantify? Apart from just a flex, one reason I got this data was to have a way to understand how the factors of a seed influence its rarity. Div uses the colors red, green, and blue to encode factors of 2, 3, and 5, so I'll use these colors and combinations of them to categorize seeds. A red seed has a factor of 2, but not 3 or 5. In other words, when you take the greatest common divisor of that seed with 30, you get 2. A green seed would give you 3, a blue seed 5, a red-green seed 6, red-blue 10, green-blue 15, red-green-blue 30, and a color-free seed 1. I like this split a little bit more than prime versus composite. As you climb off to infinity, there's actually a consistent proportion of each of these numbers. Every interval of 30 natural numbers will have 8 color-free, 8 red, 4 green, 2 blue, 4 red-green, 2 red-blue, 1 green-blue, and 1 red-green-blue. 
If you were to talk instead about primes, the proportion of prime numbers keeps decreasing as you go up. And really, if you're playing div, there's very little difference between a prime and a composite number that only has large factors. So let's count the number of seeds I got of each kind. Now in our real data, there's some sigmoid function where for small examples, we will unlock all of them. For big numbers, we won't have unlocked any, and in between there's some curve. I want to know where this turning point lives, but for reasons I'll explain in a bit, I'm going to cheat. If we pretend that I only got the smallest seeds in a given category, we change the shape from a sigmoid to a step function. The total number is the same, this vaguely preserves the turning point. So because I have 126 red seeds, I'll estimate the turning point as the 126th smallest red seed, which is 472. Continuing for all the other colors, these give seeds that it's about equally likely that I do or don't have them unlocked. And in data, I actually have exactly half of them. I haven't unlocked any of 472, 987, 230, or 3901, but I have unlocked 1765, 138, 465, and 30. Knowing these numbers are sort of the empirical halfway points for an estimated 2000 games helps pose the question, if I want to unlock a specific seed, how many games should I expect to play before it has a 50-50 chance to happen? Well, I, I would want a lot more data to be able to answer that with better confidence. And fortunately, a few years ago, I wrote an AI to play div. It's a basic C re-implementation of the game that looks ahead a few moves, scores all the resulting boards, and then takes the move leading to the best expected value. It's not very sophisticated, but it does run fast. This AI can play an entire decent game of Div in about 2 milliseconds. I specifically say a decent game, not a great one. As it turns out, dumber and faster settings are the best way to get data. In a race to 1,500 distinct seeds, an AI with short look ahead got there the fastest, using 30,000 games in one minute. Different settings took 5,000 games in five minutes, still other settings 3,000 games but eight hours. Compare that to me, I took around 2,000 games but also needed three months. The AI might not have me beat in strategy, but it can't be matched in speed. And so we will use it for its speed. Just to be clear, short look ahead does not mean random moves. A random move generator scores around 384 points on average. The short look ahead AI scores around 3000 points on average, which requires an amount of skill and strategy, even if it's not aware of all the ideas that go into playing a good game of Div. Strategic differences aside, the actual proportion of seeds the AI unlocks of each category is remarkably consistent. And since there's no real benefit to stopping at 1,500 distinct seeds, I had it run until it got 10,000 distinct seeds. And then had it start over and get 10,000 distinct seeds again. If we chop it off every 1,000 seeds, the proportion seems to hold pretty strong, and by comparison to my old data, this proportion agrees pretty well. The data suggests the model when you would expect equal odds to have unlocked a seed or not, in terms of how many other seeds got unlocked before it. You just multiply the seed by a constant that depends on its factors. The proportion suggests a simple way to answer which of two seeds is more likely. For example, which is more likely, 100 or 1001? 100 is a red-blue seed, so we multiply by about 3.56. 1001 is a color-free seed, so we multiply by about 0.447. The smaller result is the one that is more likely, and in this case it says that 100 is the likelier seed. This is undoubtedly an oversimplification. All of the interesting fuzzy stick logic is gone, so when talking about seeds of the same color, the smaller seed would always be easier. I'm sure you can build this out further. You can take into account all of the factors, not just 2, 3, and 5. You can use all of the fuzzy stick logic. It would mean that there's some even deeper understanding out there somewhere. I'll be trying to do this in a blog post later, but I want to keep the video slightly more reasonable so that I can finish it at all. The last thing I want to touch on is how many games it takes. And this clearly depends on the player. Even just comparing the AI at two different lookaheads, different tunings took different number of games to reach the same number of total distinct seeds. But one thing was consistent. It was a power law. 
The relationship between the number of games and the number of distinct seeds between all of those games has a power law form with some fixed exponent. For the AI, that exponent was something like 3.6. For the random move generator, it was closer to 5.7. Since I didn't keep track of how many games I played, I can't say what it was for me, but I think it's still interesting. I think the most interesting thing is that it's not exponential. You don't have to play twice as long for every increase in achievement. So for a question like, how many games of Div would humanity need in order to unlock 10 factorial as a prime seed? You can first find out how many distinct seeds you would expect to unlock before that one. Then you would convert that number of seeds into a number of games based on the skill level of humanity in this power law form. And then you would know. Kind of. And of course, this is all just fun. So what's the point of this video? Well, much like last year's Summer of Math Exposition, I didn't come in with a special nugget of math concept that I wanted to teach. I came in with a compelling problem, or not even a problem, but an idea. A set of rules and freedom within those rules. Exploring that freedom, understanding where it can get you, is a fundamentally mathematical process. Connecting the dots to other areas of mathematics is a bonus. Div is a game and sometimes it allows you to call composite numbers prime. I think that's a compelling idea. And so I came up with a few mathematical approaches, some better and some worse, to try to take that idea from amusing to a well-studied thing. That is the point of this video. I want to view math not as a series of exercises or well-scoped problems, although those things are rewarding when they are presented well, but I want to regard math as what comes out when you want to explore a neat idea more deeply. And I sincerely hope you enjoyed. Thank you.